Okay, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, we're reading verses 16, 17, and 18 this evening. Find here in this passage, verse 16, 17, and 18, I'm titling this, Walk in the Spirit. Verse 16, this I say, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Heavenly Father, we do ask this evening again for your blessings to be upon the reading of Holy Scripture. And we pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts in this section. We pray, Lord, thy will to be done, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. This is our fourth message in this chapter. We're going to title this, The uh, Walk in the Spirit. We've dealt with the, these kind of things before, but we're coming in, as I said uh, a week or so ago, to a very practical section and very good section. These uh, verses can uh, really help us a lot in our Christian walk. Now, we preached a message in chapter 3 titled, The Work of the Spirit, in verses 2 uh, through 5. And I want you to notice now as we come here to our text, glad to have Brian and you folks with us. I've done forgot the two names, but anyway, I'll remember it the next time. And uh, he said, uh, he said every time I'm in Lowe's, I invite him to church where he works at. And that's been, what, 14 years now I've been doing that? And uh, so glad to have you with us. I used to carry him and at least one or two of his sisters to church for probably, I don't know, when they're very young, prob uh, teens, probably, um, I don't know, uh, two or three years that I'd go down and pick them up and bring them to church. They live down the road here away, so we're glad to have you with us tonight. If you look over this, the latter part of this chapter, they are four divisions. The verses we just read, verse 16 through 18, is an exhortation to walk in the Spirit. In verses 19 through 21, there is a list of the works of the flesh. And then in verse 22 and 23, we find the fruit of the Spirit. And then in verses 24 through 26, there is a summary. So we're going to spend at least four messages in these verses, maybe six. Now, notice with me, as we look at verse 16 through 18 tonight, and I will repeat myself a little bit of something we've done in chapter 3, and I think it's necessary for here, but I want you to notice in verse 16 through 18, the verses we just read, that there are only two ways that an individual can walk. It is either in the flesh or in the Spirit. Reading these verses again, this, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, now the flesh here, that he's talking about. The flesh is used a couple of different ways in Scripture. And sometimes it can just simply refer to the physical body that we live in. And sometimes it can refer to the Adamic nature, the old nature, the natural man. And that's what we're talking about here. Not just your body, but he's referring also to the Adamic nature, that which we're born with. We call it the Adamic nature because we're descendants of Adam. Adam and Eve fell in the garden. They sinned, rebelled against God. We're descendants, have the same blood flowing through us. And so we're fallen creatures. And that's why that we must be born again. And that's why he tells us to walk in the flesh. And what we find is that when we consider the natural man, the old man, the Bible calls it in a Ephesians 4 and I think Colossians 3, uh, it's called, we, we refer to it as the Adamic nature, is that out of, out of that is what flows uh, the evils that are mentioned in verse 19 through 21. Notice this, verse 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are these, which are, uh, he says, uh, adultery, 
fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is not all that is listed. There's a list in here in Galatians 5, one in Ephesians 5, one in Colossians 3. There's also a list in Peter. There's a list in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 8. There's also a list in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. And there's some other places. Uh, like in uh, Matthew, I want to say 19, where he gives a list of the things that comes out of the heart and so forth. So he's talking about the, the Adamic nature. Uh, he's talking about the flesh. And the flesh has been corrupted through sin. But I want you to notice that when, when we read these verses, there's only two ways that we can walk. There's not a third way. We either walk in the flesh or we walk in the Spirit. Now, you've got to have the Spirit in you. You've got to be born again before you can walk in the Spirit or be filled with the Spirit or pray in the Spirit. And so, so these are realities. So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Now again, we've, over the years and, uh, 29 and plus years, uh, in, in this church, we've talked about this a number of times. Uh, to walk, we, we, we told here in the passage, verse 16, to walk in the Spirit, and we're told in verse 18 to be led by the Spirit. Then we find other places, like, well, verse 25, he said, if we live in the Spirit, in other words, if we're saved, born again, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So this is a very important subject. It's very simple as we read it and we can understand it, but it's very uh, serious. And we find that in Ephesians 5.18 that we're told to be filled with the Spirit. And we're not to walk after the counsel of the ungodly, as in Psalms chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. And so, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, it means, and by the way, when you use the word walk in the Bible, many times it's referring to our Christian life. It's referring to our everyday activities. And a lost man is walking according to the flesh, according to the counsel um, of the ungodly and so forth. The Christian is told, because he has the Spirit of God in him, he is told to walk in the Spirit. And it basically means to be under the guidance of the Spirit. It is to be governed and to be surrendered to the Spirit. And it is to be submitted to the Spirit. Now, the Spirit of God and the Word of God never go contrary to one another. So what we find in the Word and we have the indwelling Spirit, then we are to walk in it. It is the opposite of verse 19 through uh, 21. It is the very opposite of walking in the flesh. Notice verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, and he lists them. So to walk in the Spirit, I know this sounds, sounds simplistic, but me as a preacher that's been preaching nearly 37 years and been a Christian 47 years, if I need this, I know that you need it too. We need to go over. And over. Sister Joanna and I were talking about this before the service. There are things, and, and we all have relatives and friends who are just going farther and farther in the opposite direction. And her and I were talking, and she's got a few years on me, and uh, and I'm all going on 67, and we were talking that we need this stuff daily. We have to look into the Word, we have to pray, we have to ask God, how are we to walk and live, or we will be on the same track that ever that, that the world is on. So when we look at this, this is to be controlled or influenced by the Spirit. And he says here in verse 16, this I say, and, and by the way, this is to prevent what we're reading, this is to prevent the um, evils that are mentioned 
even when we were looking last week, not only in verses 19 through 21, but in verses 13 through 15, we're talking about not abusing our liberty. And we're talking about that in verse 15, if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be, uh, be not consumed one of another. The only way to not do that is to walk in the Spirit according to the Word of God. Now notice he said, verse 16, This I say, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I've been thinking about that word fulfill. What does that mean? To fulfill something means to perform or to live it out or to yield to it. So the only way to not fulfill the lust of the flesh is that we walk in the Spirit. Now, notice verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, he said, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we've got this twice in this one chapter. And then in verse 18, if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So we're talking about twice walking the Spirit, once living in the Spirit, and another time being led by the Spirit. So we see the importance here of this. The lust that's mentioned there would be the desire, the cravings, and the passions of the flesh that he's telling us not to walk in. We're not to perform that. And so notice now in verse 24. In verse 24, he says here, And they that are Christ, notice have, past tense, have crucified the flesh with the, with the affections and lust. Now what does that mean? We're going to spend some time on that in the weeks to come. Uh, they that are Christ have crucified. That's sort of like Galatians 2.20. In Galatians 2.20 said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. When he says that they that are Christ, those who are true Christians, that they have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, He's saying that at conversion, you've heard me say this many times, at conversion, every true believer, they crucified the flesh in the sense that they repented and renounced sin. In other words, when we came to saving faith in Jesus Christ, we repent of our unbelief, our sins, and so forth. And so in that sense, the day that we accepted Christ as our Savior, we crucified the flesh. Now, notice uh, back in... I'll tell you what. Uh, turn with me, please. Uh, I'll just give you chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, talking about, again, uh, that of receiving the Spirit. And then in chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, we the Bible tells us by the Spirit we have that testimony in our heart. But notice now as we turn to 1 Corinthians and chapter 3. Now this is just a little bit, not much, but just a little bit of repetition. But notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're talking about walking in the Spirit. But we've got to have the Spirit within us before that we can walk in it. Now notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm going to be reading uh, verse 16 and verse 17. I want you to notice here that every believer has the Spirit of God in them. And it says here in verse 16 and 17, Know ye not that you're the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So every believer, we're not only collectively the church, the temple of God, but every believer has the Spirit of God in them. Notice in 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm reading verse 12 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, reading in verse 12 and in verse 13. 
And we're talking about the fact that the Spirit of God dwells in us. He says here in verse 12, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now watch this. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one Spirit. The concept of the drinking here is that the Spirit is represented in the Bible as living waters in John 7 and other places. And so we find here, for by one Spirit, verse 13, are we all baptized into one body. How did we get into Christ? By the Spirit. By the Spirit. The Spirit places us in Christ. And not only that, the Spirit of God dwells inside of the believer. Notice in Romans 8. In Romans chapter 8. Go back one book. Romans chapter 8. And I'm reading... In Romans chapter 8, I'm reading verse 15. Notice in verse 15 and 16. He says in verse, let me back up to verse 14. He said, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now think about that. He even says in verse 8, verse 9 rather, he said, But you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of his. So no one is a Christian apart from the Spirit of God. In verse 14, he says that we are, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, notice they are the sons of God. Verse 15, he says, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now, verse 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Spirit of God that's in our hearts that bear... When we're born again, I'm going to show you in a moment, we're born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells in our hearts and it bears witness with our spirit. See, man is made up of body, soul, and spirit. So the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit and and gives testimony that we are the children of God. In verse 27 and 20, 26, rather, and 27, it is the Spirit that even helps us in our prayer. We can't even pray properly without the Spirit of God. We'll always pray for the wrong things. And uh, the Spirit of God helps us even in our uh, prayers. And that's just very important. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 and 12, that we cannot know anything of God. Oh, you can read the Bible. You can quote Scripture. But we cannot really know spiritual things. And he compares it with this. He said, no man knows the things of man except by the spirit of man that's in him. And the same is true with God. No one knows truly God and the things of God except by the Spirit of God that dwelleth in them. And so, that's very important. Now turn with me to John 3. In John chapter 3, and notice here. We're going to get back to the walking in the Spirit in just a moment. But notice in John chapter 3. I want to begin reading in verse 3 and go down to verse 8. And notice this passage. As we look into the Scripture we see that the Spirit is the gift of God. It is salvation. We know that it's the gift of God in many places. In Acts 10, verse 44 through 47, when Cornelius heard the preaching of Peter, we find that they received the gift of God. That's repeated again in Acts 11. Verse 13 through 18. And it's repeated again in Acts 15 verses 9 through about uh, 12. And so the Spirit of God is a gift given to us. And it is the gift of salvation. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6, 23. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, again, says that salvation is a gift of God. Now, notice with me, as we come here to John 3, 
And this is the Lord Jesus talking to Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a religious man, and the Lord still told him that he needed to be born again or born of the Spirit. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says, Nicodemus, in verse 4, saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is thinking the physical side of this, and Christ is speaking of spiritual things. Verse 5, And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, that is, of the flesh and spirit, natural and spiritual, he says he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Then he explains it. He said, verse 6, But that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that's your first birth, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Again, he's emphasizing that we must be born again to see and to enter into God's kingdom. And notice he said in verse 7 and 8, verse 7 he said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. What does it mean to be born again? It means to be born of the Spirit. To be regenerated. And then he says in verse 8, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whether it goes, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. And so, we know, we can look out here, and we cannot see the wind any more than you can see the Spirit. But we can see the effect of the wind. We can see the effects, the accomplishments of the wind. The same is true of the Spirit. We can, you cannot see the Spirit of God in an individual, but you can see the product of that. You can see the, the effect of that. Now, and we're going to be talking about the, the Spirit a lot in the next few weeks here on Wednesday, uh, Sunday night. And, Notice now, as we come to John chapter 7, in John chapter 7, I'm reading in verse 37 uh, through about verse 39. This is during the Lord Jesus' earthly ministry. Uh, This is right before He went to the cross. And it says in verse 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, this would have been, I believe, the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit. Now see the connection there between the living water and Spirit. He said, He spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So from the day of Pentecost till now, the person that accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, God puts the gift of salvation, as in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, He puts that in them, He saves them, He puts His Spirit within them. And from that point on, they can now walk in the Spirit. It's impossible to walk in the Spirit, or you can do some good things and whatever, but it's impossible to walk in the Spirit if you don't have the Spirit of God in you. Notice in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse uh, 16. John chapter 14. He says here in verse 16, I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he for he dwelleth with you, notice speaking to the disciples, and shall be in you. And that's exactly what happened with these disciples. Verse twenty six he says, But the comforter, now the comforter is the Holy Spirit, but the comforter which is The Holy Ghost, here he says, Whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, 
whatsoever I have said unto you. And he did, and they gave us the Holy Scripture. Now, we're talking about the fact that if we're going to walk in the Spirit, we must have the Spirit of God in us. In other words, we must be born of the Spirit. Now, let's take a few verses on walking in the Spirit. Turn with me, please, to Ephesians. We read this verse last week and several times this year. Notice in Ephesians 2. Let me read just a couple of verses here, and then we're going to chapter 5. Notice, or chapter 4. Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 2. And you hath he quickened. Now, there's that new birth, quickened, to be made alive spiritually. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, notice this. Wherein in time past ye what? Walked. Walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And then even in verse 3, he mentions in that passage, you walked according to the lust of her flesh and the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature, that is birth, the children of wrath, even as others. So there, here we see, uh, before we were saved, we walked according to this world. We walked according to the course of this world. Now notice in chapter 4. In chapter 4, reading in verse 1 and 2. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk. Speaking to the same church. He said, once you walked according to the course of this world and the desires and lust of the flesh. Here, he's saying, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherein you're called with all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice with me again in chapter 5. In chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, he says here, But ye are therefore followers, be ye therefore rather followers of God as dear children, watch this, and walk in love as Christ." Also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling Savior. The Bible speaks a lot about walking, walking the right way and not the wrong way. Turn with me again to verse 15. He says in verse 15 of chapter 5, he says, See then that you walk circumspectly and not as fools but as wise. To walk circumspectly is to walk with a goal in mind that is a goal to please God. We see this again in Philippians, the next book to your right, Philippians 3, verse 16. Notice with Philippians chapter 3, verses 16 through about verse 18. So we find this over and over and over again in Scripture. He says here in Philippians 3, and verse 16, beginning there, Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk. Here it is. Let us walk by the same rule. And he said, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk. Notice we got both kinds of walk here. One in the spirit and one in the flesh. He said, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So there's only two ways that we can walk. There is not a three, there's not four, there's only two ways, either in the Spirit or in the flesh. Notice with me also, um, uh, in... Uh, I'm trying to think that there's so many, so many verses. Um, Colossians chapter one. Just turn to another book here. Colossians one. I want to begin reading in verse nine. Notice here as we come to this. And by the way, Romans six four says that we're to walk in newness of life. In other words, in resurrection power. First John two six tells it that the, those who, I'm putting this in my own words, those who say they have faith, 
He says they ought also to walk even as He walked, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, this is not an isolated subject. And we could go to Old Testament passages, New Testament passages. Alright, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 and verse 10. He said, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, that is, their faith, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, why do we need that? Why do we need to be filled with the Spirit, filled with His will and knowledge and spiritual understanding? Verse 10, that you might walk. See that? That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasings, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, he continues on uh, in verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So we see this subject over and over in the New Testament. Now, go back with me to Galatians and this time to Galatians chapter 6. In Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading verse 15 and 16. He says here in verse 15 and 16, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule. Now this rule is the gospel in our text. But as many, we're talking about walking now, but as many as walk according to this rule. Notice he said, Peace be on them and mercy and upon them the Israel of God. In other words, upon the whole church. Because the church is the Israel of God here in this passage. Now go back to Galatians 5. In Galatians chapter 5, we're reading verse 16 again. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's not complicated, is it? It's not complicated. We put some other scripture with that. And in other words, we're to be occupied with things of the Spirit. We're to be governed and influenced by the Spirit. And again, the Spirit of God and the Word of God never go contrary to one or the other. You say, what does the Spirit have to say to me? Read His Word. And as we read His Word or listen to His Word, the Word will show us what the Spirit would have us to do. They work in total harmony with one another. Never go contrary. Now, what's this in verse 17 about the flesh and the Spirit? By the way, they don't like each other. In verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. This word lusteth um, means to strive against. It's like a tug of war. There is a spiritual duel, a battle. There is a there's this constant continual conflict that's going on face to face combat with the flesh and the Spirit. Now, getting saved is the greatest thing that anyone can ever do. First of all, it gives you a pass into heaven to be born again. But also, by being born again, it helps us to deal with the flesh. Now, we're going to live in this body until the day we die. And we're going to have to deal with certain things. We've, we've got to deal with it. We, we've got to put, we've got to suppress it. As the Apostle Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 9, the latter two verses of that chapter. And we've got to deal with it. But we can't deal with it as a lost man or woman. We can only deal with it by the Spirit of God. We have two natures dwelling within us. We have a divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4 which is the Holy Spirit. We have that divine nature, 
It's referred to as a new creature in 2 Corinthians 5.17. If any man be in Christ, he is, you know, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Colossians 3.10 and 11 speak of this. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 19 through about verse 25, speaks of putting off the old man and putting on the new man. So, before a person is saved, oh, they might be able to quote the Bible and say they believe in Jesus, but they're still lost. Before a person is saved, their whole life is dominated by the flesh. And I'm not talking about just drinking and drugs and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot more. When we read through this uh, section down here, there's all kind of things here. There's jealousy and envying, hatred and, and all sorts of things down here. It's much, much more. What we have in verses 19 through 21, what we have here is that we have sexual sins, that is, immorality and impurity. We also have spiritual sins, corrupt worship, such as idolatry and witchcraft. But we also have social sins, personal relationships, and we have here selfish sins, such as self-indulgence and things of that nature. There's all kind of sins here. I mean, he lists, he begins these sins here in verse 19 with sexual sins, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. I mean, there's four sins, sexual sins right there that he begins with. And then he steps into spiritual sins, idolatry and witchcraft, and moves on from there. The only way that we can get into heaven is through the new birth, to be born again. And then on top of that, the only way we can have victory in our life in dealing with these two natures is that we must have that Spirit of God, that divine nature, that new creature, we must have that within us, and we have responsibilities to both of them. We have a responsibility to the flesh, and we have a responsibility to the Spirit, one to the old nature and the new nature. The Spirit, by the way, is the new nature, the gift of God. And we have, we have a responsibility to the Spirit that we are to walk in the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, be led of the Spirit, be guided by the Spirit and His Word. You know what our responsibility is to the old nature, the flesh? Put it on a low-calorie diet. That's our responsibility to it. We are to deal with it. Now, it's going, it, we got to live in this body until the day Christ comes or we're put in the grave, and we, we've just got to live in it. Now, notice in verse 17, this war. There is a tug of war. There is that battle that that is continually being waged. He said, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. If we don't walk in the spirit, then the flesh will dominate our thinking, our habits, and dominate what we want to read and what we want to listen to. It'll dominate the friends that we want to have around us. It'll dominate what we want to watch, the places we want to go. And so as a Christian, according to Romans chapter 6, that's a wonderful chapter, but according to Romans chapter 6, as a Christian, we are to walk in newness of life. The whole chapter is dealing with what Christ has done for us about our new birth, but it's also dealing with us. He says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. And then he tells us how to walk in newness of life. And we are the, at court, Romans 6, we are the servants of sin or the servants of the Savior. And so there's only two groups here and two courses and there's only two paths of life. Now, notice he tells us in verse 17 that they're contrary one to the other. They're contrary. They're opposite in nature. If we, Listen, here's the best way. Learn something about yourself. 
People want to find themselves. Find it in the book. Find it in the Bible. Because God will tell us how to deal with the old nature. They're contrary. They're opposite in nature. They will never harmonize because what they produce is totally the opposite. I'll give an example. Here's what the flesh produces. And there's, again, Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 6, Romans 13, uh, actually Romans chapter 6, and Romans, thir- yeah, Romans 6 and 13, and chapter 8, 1 Corinthians 6, and uh, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5. This thing just goes on and on. But let me show you what the flesh produces again. This is not all of it. This is only a part of it. He says in verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, there's much more. And then he says, and then he says, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, now these ought to be sobering words to us tonight, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Get out here and start witnessing to people. I do it almost weekly. Oh, I'm okay. I'm going to say, no, you're not. None of us are okay without Christ. None of us are okay without the new birth, without being born again. And what people end up doing a lot of times, comparing them with somebody else. They find somebody a little bit worse than them. Now notice what the Spirit produces. Totally opposite. Verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit, here we go, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Against such there is no law. These things are not condemned or contrary to the law. Because this is what the law speaks about. Now let's close in verse 18. He says here in verse 18, he said, But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. We're not under its condemnation, its curse, its guilt, or its power. Romans 6, verse 14 and 15, The righteous man he, the righteous uh, man walks in the Spirit and produces the fruit of the Spirit and not the works of the law. Matter of fact, in 1 Timothy 1, 9, he says that the law is not made for the righteous man, basically, but the law is made for the man that's lost, to show him that he is lost. Now again, next week we're going to step into verse at least verse 19, maybe verse 19 and 20. And I just want you to be looking over these things. I want you to be considering these things. And because we're into, really you can call it doctrinal like you can anything else, but we're into some very practical things here as we come into this chapter. And I want to leave with you tonight is that the importance of, of the Spirit of God that's given to us in this chapter. Spirit of God, verse 16, verse 17, verse 18, in verse 22 and 23, verse 25. And no one goes to heaven without the Spirit of God. And you cannot have the Spirit of God unless there's repentance and faith. Jesus Christ died for our sins at Calvary, shed His blood. He he was raised the third day, ascended back into heaven. He's the Savior of the world. And so we must accept that. We must repent of our sins and put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Trust Him uh, for eternal life. And, I mean, this is so clear as we come through the Scripture. And again, verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, that is, if we're saved, He said, let us also walk in the Spirit. 
This is a section we're getting to. And let me tell you something. He gives us a checklist. He gives us a clear list. And He tells us that those who live in these sins, in verse 19, 20, and 21, that they shall not inherit. Those who habitually commit those sins and live in those sins, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We must be born again, and the Spirit of God that dwells in us will produce these things that are listed in verse 22, verse 23. We had four saved the other night in the mission. We got to sit down and talk with with Avery, eight or ten at least, maybe more, and, uh, and talk to them. And there is nothing more important than your eternal destiny. Nothing. And then once you settle your eternal destiny, there's nothing more important than us walking in the Spirit and walking in faith. Would you stand with me, please? Father, we thank You tonight for Your love, Your mercy, and Your grace. We thank You for the indwelling Holy Spirit. And Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the truth that You've given us. Lord, help us to continually to glean from this section. Teach us, Lord, that we might be faithful to Thee. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray.